program or multi-process system and a single or a limited number of processors, then you have to uh, share processor time, okay? So you have multiple processes or multiple threads, pretty much works the same way. You only have one instruction running on a core at a time, okay? So in order to allow multiple processors uh, or multiple processes to run, um, then you've got to do some sort of schedule, okay? Um, and if you have multiple processors or multiple cores, now you can start getting a little bit of parallelism. All right, um, so basically you've got a lot of processes out there. Some of them will be blocked, some of them will be ready, some of them are going to actually be running. So we have our three states. So basically the scheduler is going to determine which order that we run the processes that are currently in a ready state. Okay, now, there's a couple of ways to do this. One is batch, okay? And a batch system just says, hey, I've got a queue. Um, we're gonna queue all these things up and I'm gonna run them in the order. It's a, a first in, first out queue, FIFO, okay? Um, so that's things, you know, if you have three things come in, A, B, C, you put them in that order, you take them out in that order. So A is gonna run first, B gets run second, C gets run third. Um, you can't do a whole lot of parallelism this way. Um, and I mean, the way old computers used to, you know, especially like when I was taking my computer course at LSUS many years ago, um, we couldn't afford the compiler, okay? The big university down in Baton Rouge had a copy, a copy of the compiler. And so what we would do is we would punch everything on the cards we would take our card deck, okay, our program, we'd go over, we'd put it in the desk, um, they would, the little RJE guy would pick it up and say, okay, he put it in the hopper, and then somebody else would put their program in, and somebody else would turn their program in, and when they had enough of them, they'd put them in the hopper in order, and then they'd say, go, and blah, read them all in, ship them all down to Baton Rouge, Baton Rouge would process them, and then it would send back the results, they'd print out the results, and you'd go, oh shoot, error in line two. <sighs> you'd go over there, you'd reprint on card two, put it back in, and you put it on the desk. Horrible process. Turnaround time was like 20 minutes. So you made sure it didn't have any errors. Um, as the programs got less expensive, as you got more and more processors, more and more memory, um, that abundance of resources allowed for multi programs. We can run all four of them at the same time, or 20 of them at the same time. But it sort of depends on the characteristics of the program. So for example, program A, it's doing lots and lots and lots of calculations, right? And then just a little bit of I.O., and then lots and lots of calculations, okay? So it is CPU intensive, all right? Now you have another program that does a little bit of calculations and then goes out and reads a whole bunch off the, data, uh, off the uh, disk and does a little bit of calculation and reads a whole bunch off the disk. So it's spending 90% of its time doing I.O., okay? So process A is gonna be CPU bound, process B is gonna be uh, I.O. bound. They're gonna have completely different characteristics, okay? Their needs for computer resources. I mean, B, it's gonna go into the wait uh, or uh, uh, block state all the time, right? A it's hardly ever gonna go into a block state. So remember the um, slide we had a long, long time back when you had 80% CPU usage on the, C, on the uh, program? Then the first one could run no problem. The second one, yeah, you could still run. As soon as you hit that third one, you basically max out the CPU. But if you had something that was very uh, I.O. based, so only used 10% of the CPU, man, you could do 10 of those things before it ever maxed out. So your ability to run multiple things at a time sort of depends on their behavior. If they're CPU based, you can only you can run a few things at a time. If they're IO based, you can run a lot. Yes? Okay, so I know you, obviously we can't use more than like 100% of the CPU, so it's maxed there, but is there like an upper limit on how much you can like uh, put on the, uh, put like stress on the IO, I guess? Like, yes. Uh, so like if you, uh, like you're saying, if you have ten really I/O intensive programs, you can run ten of them and max to max out the CPU. But like, right. 
what happens to the I.O. if you're adding that much? Absolutely. If you have a dedicated resource and it's controlling all the I.O., mm -hmm. um, and there's only one entrance into that, then yeah, you can become you know dependent upon that resource and blocked on that resource too. Okay. Um, but you may have where this process, uh, let's say you have a DMA controller. You, know, you have a, it, it's not in the CPU, but you have a separate controller for the, the disk I.O. Um, you can still be doing computer stuff, or stuff here in the processor, and the I.O. controller is actually doing stuff over here. They can be doing things at the same time. Okay. So if you have one that is I.O. Uh, dependent, and you've got a controller out here that can run independent of the CPU, then you can be doing a CPU round process and an IO bound process. In a similar way, um, if it is such that I can go ahead and have process one and process two are both trying to hit the IO controller, mm -hmm. and the IO controller is smart enough to say, okay, I'm going to start processing your results. Okay, I'm going to send the, uh, the disk, you know, it's going to have to rotate around mm -hmm. to the place that it needs to be. We have to move the head back to the track that needs to be. You know, we have to do the whole uh, cylinder sector track thing. Yeah. Um, well, while it's moving, I've got to wait for it so I can start processing the next one. And I'm going, oh, okay, I, I know where to send it now. Now I know where to send it now. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm already there. I'm going to go ahead and do his request now, mm -hmm. even though he's third in the list, because I'm already on that sector and track. Okay. And then, so basically, all of the things that we're talking about on the scheduling and behavior that's dealing with CPU utilizations mm -hmm. could also be done at the I.O. level. Okay. okay. And it's just like, you know, you have caches, your L1 and your L2 cache. The idea of, hey, this is really expensive and it's fast, so we'll have a little bit of this, and we'll have a secondary cache that's less expensive, and well, all of that works down here too. You know, okay. you can have your, hey, I'm gonna buffer my, my um, I.O. And that way I can go ahead and dump stuff up to the CPU and they the request it. So it's exact same thing as work like this. But yes, you could get log jammed at your I.O. if you have all your resources trying to get the same thing. And I guess the other example would be I've got three things doing I.O., but one of them's doing keyboard I.O., and one of them's doing screen I.O., and one of them's doing disk I.O. Well, those Three controllers may be completely separate. All right. So if we're going to schedule, when do we schedule? Well, obviously, when you create a process, you have to schedule it, right? When you delete a process, then you have to go back to the rescheduling mode. Um, anytime a process is blocked, you're going to have to go back to rescheduling. Um, and depending on what routine you're using, maybe at a certain point of time, you know, every 10 seconds or whatever, uh, I'm going to go ahead and force them to you know, give up the CPU, and then at that point we have to reschedule. <coughs> so, um, creation, deletion, blocks, and obviously interrupt uh, I/O uh, or any interrupt really um, is probably going to cause the current thing to stop pull it out, we'll handle the I.O., the interrupt, and then we have a choice then either put that one back in or go look at our schedule and see who should go next. All right, so a couple of different kinds of categories. Um, there are some programs that are very batch oriented, okay? These are gonna be things that are non-preemptive and often are very CPU intensive, okay? Large, Calculation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna run, 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 do everything on the CPU, and then I'm done. Now I'm gonna do the next one. And it's gonna run on the CPU, and I'm gonna go do the next one. Not a lot of I.O. Yes? This is the still on like the first in, first out system, right? The batch systems. Okay, well, we're actually gonna talk about just different behaviors of programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of them are very CPU intensive, therefore, a batch system works well for. Oh. There are some things that um, you, you care more about the response time. You know, hey, if I'm typing, I don't want it to freeze up. You know, I want a good response time. Um, maybe I don't care about the fairness quite so much as long as I have continual response. You know, if you're sitting there and you're playing a game, um, 
and the guy next to you is playing the game, and um, he's getting 20% of the CPU, and you're only getting 10% of the CPU. As long as you're both playing at the same speed, do you care? Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. Now, if all of a sudden his guy runs twice as fast in 10 seconds as you do, then that's unfair, right? Yeah. So you sort of have to look at the kinds of programs and go, well, as I'm calculating things, um, I'm doing my Excel homework, right? And you say recalculate, and it recalculates yours in uh, a hundredth of a second, and it recalculates yours in a thousandth of a second. Do you care? I mean, at that point, it's. I mean, you can't tell the difference. I hit the button, it shows up. He hits the button, and it showed up. Yours was a tenth of a second or a hundredth of a second. His was a thousandth of a second. Who cares, right? Um, if you're flying a plane and trying to avoid a building, do you care whether it's a hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second? Probably. Probably. Okay. So what we're going to end up seeing is that there's different categories of programs out there. Some we're going to call batch. Some we're going to call interactive. Some we're going to call real time. And the different categories of programs are going to have different needs. So when we go to schedule these things, if you've got a batch kind of system, then just fight the label. Just do it in the queue and who cares. If you're doing real time, FIFO doesn't work. Mm -hmm. okay? So we sort of have to have this category in the back of our mind so the next six slides make sense. Okay, so uh, we kind of mix and match these, like, for, that would we need, like, the different, uh, for each of, like, their strengths, I guess? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so what we're going to see is we're actually going to look at round robin uh, FIFO. Um, uh, time slice, shortest job first, etc. We're going to look at these five or six different scheduling algorithms, mm -hmm. and we're going to come back and go, okay, given the advantages and disadvantages of this one, would it work for batch? Uh, okay. Advantages and disadvantages of this one, would it work for interactive? Would it work for real time? Okay. So, so right now, we're just getting a, this is a rough categorization of programs. Mm -hmm. Are they a batch or the interactive or the real time? So then when we start talking about these things, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. would this work? Was a real time. Would yeah. this work for some of these? So, like, batch systems are not synonymous with like first in, first out, but that's what works well for them. Right. Okay. Right. All right. So, one of the characteristics of the batch system is it's non preemptive. Okay. You can't go there and say, all right, I know you're halfway through recalculating your spreadsheet, but I'm going to stop and kick you out. And then maybe later we'll come back and, and re redo that. Um, another characteristic of batch systems is they are periodic, uh, they have periodic large calculations. In other words, they're CPU bound, right? On the other hand, an interactive sense uh, system, you can be preemptive. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you hit up, 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 left, left, left on your game, and it goes up, 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 you get swapped out, a, a hundredth of a second later, you come back in and go left, left. It's okay, right? You still went up, up, and left, left. Yes? Oh, uh, I was going to ask if I could get a reminder for what it means to be preemptive or preemption. Okay, preemptive means I can take your resources away. Okay? So, for example, you get thrown up there, and this particular process, um, we have a, something else come in, and it's maybe a higher priority process. Can I take your resources away, let the other guy do his thing? and then potentially give your stuff back. Sometimes it makes sense, okay? Um, sometimes it doesn't. So for example, memory is a very preemptive resource. I can take your memory away, store it on the disk, you know, do a context switch, let somebody else do their thing, and then I can put your memory back, everything is cool. But if we're sharing a printer, I can't say, oh, I let you print the first two pages of your, or let's say the first three lines of your document on a page. Then I'm gonna let him put his three lines on the page and then let you put your three lines on the page. That's not gonna work, right? Um, so some resources, memory, are preemptive. We can take them away and give them back. Others, we can't preempt. You've got to finish what you're doing. You've got to finish that page at least before we start printing somebody else's stuff. Never mind. Okay, so interactive, you can preempt. 
you often have lots of users using it at the same time, and you often have smaller calculations, okay? Um, you're not trying to calculate the trajectory to the moon, you're just trying to say, okay, when I pushed up, my character moved forward. Does anything seem, can I see anything different? Short, easy, simple calculations, right? Um, but you want a quick response time. Because, you know, when I hit up, 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 fire, um, I don't want it to go up, up. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm standing in the middle of the road. Fire, come on, fire. Um, you want that quick response time and interactive mode. Real time, okay? Usually you don't preempt in real time because when you preempt, you have to take away, save, store, get the other guy up there, back, restore it. That's taking a lot of time, right? In real time, you've got to have uh, a very, very short response time, or at least a known response time. You know, uh, a quick example of real time would be if you're, you know, programming a cruise missile. Okay, this thing's going at Mach two. You can't sit there and go, oh, waiting to load. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh, I've just gone three miles in the time it took me to preempt and re-preempt. I have just run into a mountain. Um, so for real time things, they do not preempt. And the tasks are often very, very, very short. Because you have to say, is there anything in front of me in the next half mile? Uh, no, OK, great, because I'm going. Yes, oops, I need to avoid. I mean, it's short, quick. You know, am I OK? Am I on target? Do I need to, you know, whatever. Do I need to go up, down, left, right, or explode? Uh, OK, so you have three types of things. Batch simple systems, non-preemptive, large calculations. Yes? Um, so if the batch system has like a large calculation that takes a lot of CPU, yep. are the interactive in real time uh, more, I guess more, I guess the interactive is this using preemption, is interactive more I.O. bound then? Um, okay, well, and it's not necessarily just I.O. or CPU, there's other factors. Okay. So here, lots of calculations, CPU bound. Here, short calculations. Here, short calculations. Mm -hmm. So both of these are short calculations. Um, this one you want a quick response time. This one you don't just want a variable, you know, a quick response time. Maybe a half a second, maybe a thousandth of a second. Real time, I want exactly. It is never more than three hundred thousandth of a second. Okay. The interactive it can be variable. Okay. Have you ever played a game, you know, and at you know six p.m. it's really really slow, but at two a.m. it's blindingly really fast. Okay. Um, you still want a quick response time. You know, as long as it's less than, you know, bump, 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 okay, I'm so good. Um, but you can handle a little bit of time lag. Uh, in the real time, you can't. You absolutely positively have to have it to that. All right, so those are our three sort of categories of programs. So the whole idea is we, we have to schedule these things. And we want to meet certain goals, okay? So one of the goals is just fairness, okay? Um, if you always got CPU time and you never got CPU time, that wouldn't be fair, right? Um, there are certain other policies that we're gonna go ahead and install, and we wanna make sure that those policies are carried out. One of those policies might be deadlock avoidance. We never want to get into um, a deadlock situation. Also, um, you know, we can, we can say, well, you're always gonna get time, and you're always gonna get time, and you're always gonna get time. But one way to do that is just parallel everybody. You get the whole thing until you're done, and then you get the whole thing until you're done, and then you get the whole thing. It's horrible as far as balance, because as soon as you get blocked, we're gonna let you stay in control. And so everybody's gonna get time, but we're never gonna use the resources to the max. It would be better as soon as you're blocked on I.O., we give you the CPU. As soon as you're blocked, then we give you the CPU. So we wanna be fair, we wanna be balanced, and there are certain other policies that we wanna enforce like no deadline. All of the systems are gonna have those. A batch system is also gonna go ahead and try and maximize throughput, okay? Because, you know, as I said, 
programmer one puts his deck in there, and programmer two and three and four, they all put their programs, the program decks or card decks in that thing, and nobody wants to wait 20 minutes. We want quick turnaround. I mean, I, want, I would much rather say, hey, when I put that program in, by the time I get to the printer, I'm going to back. Okay, I want that throughput so I can get five or six or eight changes an hour, not three. Um, turnaround time. You want to minimize um, the time between submission and termination. Now, is throughput the same as turnaround time? So what's the difference? I guess turnaround time contributes to throughput, but throughput is just the maximization of how many jobs you're completing in an hour. The number of jobs, yep. But yeah, the net maximizing the number of jobs, but the turnaround time is just minimizing how much time is in between each job, right? Or how long the job takes plus how long it had to wait. Yeah. So for example, if you had a job that took one minute, and one minute, and one minute, and 60 minutes, okay, then we can go ahead and let him go first. So he had zero wait time and 60 minutes. So it took him 60 minutes to get results. If we let you go second, it took you 61 minutes to get results, 62 minutes, and 63 minutes, right? So all total, everybody have an average waiting time of 60 two minutes, right? Or 61 minutes? If we did it the other way around, and he had a one minute job, he goes first, he got his results in one minute. He comes up, he had to wait one minute and run one minute, so his time was two. You had to wait two minutes and ran one minute, so your time was three, right? And then you had to uh, wait three minutes and then run 60 minutes, so his time was 63. You average all that out, it's about 23 minutes average wait time, right? So we can maximize throughput by saying, how many, how many jobs do we get through? Or we can max, um, minimize the turnaround time. So if we did it um, in the reverse order, then the wait times were huge, right? Because the short jobs didn't get to go very fast. Another way to look at it is, let's say you put your one minute, one minute, one minute, 60 minute jobs in, and a minute later, he goes out of the queue. A minute later, he goes out of the queue. About that time, these two guys come in, and they put a one-minute job in. Well, if we put him on hold, because he's got a 60-minute job, and let those other two through, man, we can get all of those done. We can get five, 10, we can get 50 one-minute jobs done, and then start on his. So our throughput, I'm sorry, yeah, the throughput might be 60, okay? But it wouldn't be fair to him, just because he's got a long job, he may never get time, right? It may be two o'clock in the morning before no more jobs comes in and we finally run hits. So throughput is just cranking out the jobs, the number of jobs. Turnaround time adds in that average weight, okay? Uh, and of course, we want to keep that CPU as busy as possible. We don't want to waste that resource. So those are some of the goals for batch systems. Interactive, uh, again, it's all about the response time. We always want to be able to, I mean, never want it to freeze up while you're playing. And proportionality. Um, you want to sort of meet the needs of the folks. And if you're running and the guy run, is running next to you and he's running twice as fast as you, that doesn't seem fair, right? Um, you can't compete because they can fire you know, 50 bullets at the time, you can fire 20. So you want to have sort of an even or balanced response, and you want a, a proportional response, and you want a very short response time. But it can vary, you know? Real-time systems, um, you absolutely positively have to meet a timeline, okay? Um, and you really want a very predictable timeline so that um, you know how fast the rocket can go um, so that it doesn't overshoot your calculations. So now that we sort of have the idea of what kinds of programs are out there and what are some of our goals, 
Now, let's look at what are the actual algorithms that are out there and see which ones, which goals they would meet, therefore which programs it would be appropriate for. So first come, first serve. It's really good for batch processes, okay? The processes are run at the time they're scheduled, so you know, hey, if you four came in, we're going to run yours, and then yours, and yours, and yours. Um, it's a super simple um, system to implement. Uh, simple queuing, you don't have to worry about the length of the process. You don't care that yours is a one minute, yours is a 60 minute. It's just, that's the order they came in, that's the order they're gonna get processed. And as we've said, um, doing that can end up giving very long uh, wait times. Therefore, your uh, turnaround time may not be minimized. All right, so almost nobody does short stop first. I mean, I'm sorry, um, almost nobody does the simple first come first serve. What they do sometimes do is they look at all the scheduled jobs and say, I'm gonna pick the shortest one first, okay? So that way, if we have a one, 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 and 60, we're gonna do the three ones before we ever try to take on the 60. So the process, the shortest execution time is picked. Every time a new process comes in, they reschedule, okay? So if we have a one, 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 60, then we're gonna do the one, we're gonna do the one. If a new process, a one and a one comes in, we resort the queue, uh, or resort the schedule, and we're gonna put the two ones first, because the shortest job always goes first. Now, what can this lead to? Uh, exactly. The longest job goes last, or may never go. All right, so there's another version. Let's say, we had a one, and a one, and a one, and a 60. Actually, let's do a, a, a four, a four, a four, a 60. So we're gonna do the four, and then we're gonna do the four, and a one comes in. Well, we're gonna put the shortest job in, right? But the other option is, let's say we're halfway through the four job, and a one comes in. Well, the other one would let the four finish and then do the one. Shortest remaining time says if somebody comes in and there's two left on the first process, but there's only a one in this new job, we're gonna do the one first because we're literally gonna do the shortest first. So we will preempt somebody even if they're in the middle of doing their four because a one came in. Now, what do you think this is gonna do to um, uh, turn around time. Is it slower? <coughs> okay, we're assuming that the cost of implementing these algorithms is zero. We'll talk about that later. Assuming the cost of implementing it is zero, if you always do the shortest, even if it's halfway through somebody's job, that's going to minimize the, uh, the weight, right? Okay. Now, yes, the cost is going to go up because we're going to have to preempt him and get him out and put him back in. So you have to be in a system that's uh, preemptible, right? Okay. So if you're in a back situation where you can't preempt, this doesn't work. But if you're in a system where you can preempt, then you can actually minimize your wait time, okay? So you're going to maximize your throughput by doing a remaining, shortest remaining time next, yes? This here wouldn't be good for like an interactive system though, would it? Because like, you're trying to get consistent response time, consistent like quick response time. Mm -hmm. You could have um, like processes jumping in front of each other that would mm -hmm. like increase the wait time. Right, right. And so the way you look at this is, okay, batch interactive in real time. Is it gonna work for batch? Uh, you can't preempt. No, you just can't preempt. Is it going to work for interactive? Well, it's possible that the 60 second job is going to get pushed to the back and pushed to the back and pushed to the back. 
and they may starve. So if you've got six people gaming and they're all fast and this guy never gets any time, so it's not fair. So it's probably not a great um, match for interactive. Now, um, if you're in real time, you sort of hate to push something off, but if you've got a super quick, hey, am I at the target, yes or no, well, maybe you want to do that. Say, okay, yes, boom. I don't have to care about calculating what I'm going to do in the next mile or the next five miles if I'm here. Yeah. So maybe it makes sense to say, hey, I've got a super short job. I'm going to do it and then back back out. Mm -hmm. um, so this might work for real time systems. Okay. But you still have the option, or you still have the likelihood of longer jobs starting, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is probably not the best algorithm. Let's keep going. All right, interactive schedule. Um, with fast systems, we need to know ahead of time how long the process runs, okay? You know, we need to know that it's a one, 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 sixty. Um, with interactive schedules, do you really know how long, I mean, do you know what the next person's move's gonna be? Maybe not, right? So you don't necessarily know how long it's gonna take for them to do that next move. So if we're gonna try and schedule based on the length of the job, how can we know what that length of job is? Now, in real time, we know, because everything's very small packages of known time, right? But in interactive, we don't know. I mean, are they gonna type a long word or a short word? You know, are they gonna do some complex flip, you know, maneuver, or is it just move forward? So What's one way of guessing how long an interactive process is going to take? The size of memory and things like that. That's a possibility. What else can we use? Has anybody ever done the market? And you know when you talk to somebody and they're saying, past performance does not, is not a clear indicator of future. Have you ever heard that in the field? They have to say that because legally, just because this stock did really well last week doesn't mean it's going to do well next week, right? But programs, if every time you run and you do a left and a left, you hit a right, and the program has you know has recorded that, that 99% of the time they do left, left, followed by a right, then you get two lefts, what do you think is going to be the next thing? All right. All right. So what you can do is you can go ahead and use the history. How long did this process run last time? Mm -hmm. um, and if they have a pretty good, you know, their mean is, uh, you know, 100 milliseconds plus or minus the standard deviation of one, then heck, I'm gonna go ahead and say this is 101 milliseconds and plan based on that. Okay. okay. So, like, but does this have the potential to like accidentally schedule like a really long process? Um, they like, just again, because the history doesn't guarantee that you don't have a long process coming. Yep. Right? Yep. Right. By the way, there is no silver bullet. Yeah. There is not one algorithm that is going to work all the time in all situations, which is why we had to sort of segregate. Well, here's this situation batch, and here's this situation real time, and here's this situation interactive, and these might work over here, but they've got some advantages and disadvantages, and those might work over here, but they still have advantages and disadvantages. All right, so um, round robin. Round robin is like the very first way people did this, simplest and oldest, okay? And what they decided is, well, instead of having a one, 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 and 60, what if we go ahead and split things and say, we're gonna split things in one uh, minute increments. And so you get your one minute, you get your one minute, you get your one minute, and you get one minute of your 60, and then you get one minute, you get one minute, okay? So everybody's gonna get a fair amount. You know, if you need 60, as soon as it comes back around to you, now you get your second minute. And as soon as it comes around to you again, now you get your third minute. Um, so basically, super easy. Each process is assigned a certain amount of time, a quantum of time, one minute, 100 milliseconds, whatever it is. You go ahead and you start running, everything's great. As soon as you finish, 
your quantum of time, you release it back to the seat, or you release it back to the scheduler. The scheduler says, okay, now we're gonna get the next one in the line. And if you're finished, great. If you're not finished, you go to the back of the line. And then the next guy gets it. And if he finishes, great. If he doesn't, goes to the back of the line. Goes to the back of the line. And so it's just sort of round off. And everybody gets their same quantum of time. One minute, 100 milliseconds, whatever. All right. So the nice thing about that is, will the shorter jobs, if I've got a one minute job and a 60 minute job, which one's gonna get done first? The one minute. Well, what if I'm in, they're in the opposite order? The 60 came first and then the one minute. The one minute's still gonna get done, right? So you sort of get the, the, the fairness of shortest job first, right? Your throughput is not gonna be too horrible because no matter what order they came in, the one minute's pretty much got done within, you know, if there's six processes, you're gonna get your one minute within six time frames, right? Um, now, if there are two minute jobs, then he's gonna get one minute, get halfway through and then swapped. One minute, one minute, one minute, and it comes back, and then he gets a second minute. So even though it was a two minute job, He's not going to get done for six minutes, right? Everybody's going to have to do their, and then comes back around and he finishes. But it's sort of even based on the number of processes. You know, if you've got a two minute uh, job and we've got a one minute quantum and five minute things, then yours is going to take about six minutes. Yours is going to take six minutes plus one, seven minutes. Yours is going to take eight minutes. But it's still a fairly small thing. It's not like the 23 minute average we had earlier. And the 60 minute person is gonna have, obviously, 60 times six. Uh, so it's gonna be a pretty long wait, but it never gets stopped. It will absolutely guarantee it will finish. Okay. So you never starve. You sort of have a, a smaller threshold or a, a throughput, and uh, it's fair. All right. Well, that's great, except that what if his job was a super high priority job? You know, um, he's playing you know, Call of Duty and he's trying to decide whether the airplane should um, um, veer off or you know, go into the mountain. Maybe we should give him some extra time. We should give him priority, right? So basically, they said, hey, we're gonna have our queue or we're going to have this little round robin thing, but we're going to have different priorities. So we're going to have the high priority round robin queue. And so, you know, let's say y'all are on the high priority, so you get some time, and you get some time, and you get some time, and then you get time, and you get time, and you get time, and you're finished, and you're finished, and you're finished. Now we'll get to you three, okay? Because y'all are in the lower priority queue. Do you see a problem with this one? Exactly. Because you could always just add more higher priority processes. Yep. Okay. So it's like, oh, shoot. Okay. So we do have priorities. We should have higher priorities getting, you know, more time. But if we do that, then it's possible to have the start to take a little bit. You're not allowed to read three slides ahead. But yeah, that's exactly what can happen. You can go ahead and have a priority. Um, you know, if you've gone all the way through, or after X quantum of time, you get bumped to the next higher priority. And then you get bumped to the next higher priority. So you'll never starve. Once you finally get um, uh, access time, then you get put back down to your normal priority. And if you get starved again, then we're gonna slowly bring you back up until you get time. So it is a way to make sure you never get started by using that uh, weight of time. All right, uh, shortest process next. Uh, again, it's basically shortest job uh, in the interactive system. Again, you don't know how long the job is, so a lot of times you'll take a weighted sum of the past times to run to 
give you an idea of how long you're going to run, your estimate of how long you're going to run the future, and then base it on the shortest one of those. All right, highest response ratio. So let's go ahead, and this is what I was, you've asked about, is if we said our response ratio is equal to W, the wait time, plus the estimated job time, divided by the estimated job time, okay? So this is what's called service time, this is what's called wait time. And so the idea is, if um, you never have to wait, then it's just service time over service time, the ratio is gonna be one, right? If you had to wait um, 100 seconds for a one second job, then it's gonna be 101 over one, a very high ratio, right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and do it highest response ratio first, right? Um, and that just means if you have been waiting a long time, you get priority, okay? This is mainly to, to uh, prevent starvation. Uh, yeah, what's going on from that? Other methods, the lottery method. We're just gonna go ahead and give each process a ticket and then we're gonna uh, roll the little thing, we'll take the ball out and say, ah, oh, process number 64, you get to go, okay? So it's gonna be completely fair, right? Because nobody had priority based off of um, their job size or how long they've been waiting. And so randomly, everybody should have equal you know, chance, right? Now, um, that's great, but maybe we have to have priority, right? So one way to simulate priority is to say, oh, well, I'm gonna give you five tickets because you're a high priority thing. So you have five times the chance that anybody else getting it. Yes, sir. Is like the CPU really just rolling the bones on like what, is this, is this practical ever? Um, <laughs> probably not. Okay. okay. But that's the thing is, there are lots of really bright people out there that have looked at this problem and gone, there's no silver bullet. There's got to be a silver bullet. I'm gonna try this. And hey, it looks great here, it looks great here. Oh, well, yeah, we have a problem with that one. Oh, something else comes up at the moment. Hey, I'm gonna do shortest job first. Hey, I'm gonna do shortest remaining job first. Hey, I'm gonna use priority cues. Hey, I'm gonna use random lottery system. Um, I'm just trying to show you some of the algorithms people have proposed and hopefully get to the point where you can look at these things and you can go, well, that looks good, and that's going to help throughput, and that's going to, ooh, wait a minute, no, no, starvation, we got a problem here. So that hopefully by the time you've looked at all these and compared them and looked at the advantages and disadvantages, you ought to be able to look at an algorithm. If somebody comes up and says, hey, I need you to schedule you know, the, uh, the lights on North Street, okay? And hey, it should be fair, and it should be quick, and it should be, what algorithm you know, should you use? And either you should say, oh, well, I'm gonna use a priority round robin, or I'm gonna use a this. You'll know at least enough to look at that and go, no, that's not a good algorithm. Let's do something different. All right, um, so again, one of the things that we want to minimize is the turnaround time. And the total turnaround time is not only the time you spent running, but the time you spent waiting. We want to make it as small as possible. Oftentimes, they will go ahead and take that turnaround time and make it um, normalized to the service time. Because if you have a turnaround time of five and you're a one second job, is that good or bad? Yeah. Maybe bad. If you had a turnaround time of 60 and you're a one second job, well, that's probably pretty bad. 
if he had a turnaround time of 60 and he's a 60 second job, that's great, right? So here, just looking at the turnaround time of five, six, and 60, you don't know if it's good or not. You have to normalize it. So if you divide it, you know, the six times divided by one, and then uh, six or seven divided by six, and the 60 divided by 60, all of a sudden it's like, hey, that's bad, that's not too bad, that's awesome. So oftentimes you use the ratio of turnaround time um, uh, over service time. Okay, so now, and hopefully y'all can see this, we can go ahead and compare all of the things we've looked at. So we're gonna look at first come, first serve, round robin, the, um, with a quantum of one, round robin with a quantum of four, shortest uh, process, shortest remaining, and that highest response time, that ratio of the, you know, the waiting time thing. All right, so the idea is we've got five processes, A, B, C, D, and E. Each of those processes have a certain time they're gonna run, three seconds, six seconds, four, five, or two, and they weren't all in the queue at the beginning. I mean, they arrived at a certain time. So for instance, um, process A was in the queue at zero. Process B didn't get there till two. C didn't get there till four. C, D at six, E at eight, okay? So even though uh, E is a very short job, E didn't get there until time eight. So you know, obviously we can't schedule E earlier than eight, yes. Is that why the round robin only has the, like the, it, it, the, is that why there's only like, I guess, spaces of like where it uses two? Because um, A gets to go effectively twice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then E gets to go twice because right. they're the first and last thing. Because at time zero, A was the only thing in there, we started running it. Um, with a quantum of one on round robin, we should have swapped out. But there's no other process here. Mm -hmm. So so at time one, then we're still going to do A. But at time two, now we have two processes in there, an A and a B, because it took three to do it. So it did one on its own, two on its own, three it had to compete with B and B1. So you can see up there, um, let me go ahead and do it this way. So you can see here at time you know, zero to one, A got it. It should have been swapped out, but there's nobody there time um, one to two, it still ran, but at two, B showed up. So we got one quantum of time, then we swapped out, A got one quantum of time, then B got one quantum of time, and by now, C has shown up, but C showed up at four, so it finally gets its quantum of time. Okay. Yes? Um, so when you say that like A and B competed, I guess uh, that third quantum, mm -hmm. Um, is it like assumed that B got there first, or did it do some kind of like actual comparison? Say like, oh, well, A's already gone through twice, so it shouldn't. So it should, B should go first here. Okay, remember round robin. It's just that cube. Yeah. And it puts it in the back. And it puts it in the back. And so what happened is, um, A was the only thing in the queue. It did this one time. It got put in the back. And immediately got on again. Yeah. And then B shows up. A got put in the back, oh, okay. so it's behind B, so B's gonna go, and then it gets put in the back, and, and then A goes. Yeah. Well, C shows up, A gets put behind C, B is gonna go, C is gonna go, then A is gonna go, okay? All right, so first come, first serve, A is the only one there. By the time we get to three, B's shown up, so B's gonna go along. C shows up, it gets put in the queue, D shows up and gets put in the queue, and we finally get to here. Once B's done, we do C, then we do D, then we do E, right? So it's very much a first come, first serve, A, B, C, D, E, or dunk. Simple to implement. Well, round robin with quantum one, we just talked about, you know, we, A was the only thing in the loop that get put in and put in and put in and B got put in, so we do A and we do B, and, and then C came up and it would be A and then B and then C, and they just swap back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. <clears throat> Assuming we have a time of one. If we have a time of four, then A gets one, two, three. It would have gone to four, but it didn't need four because it's only a time of three, length of three jobs. So now B gets its one, two, three, four. 
and then C gets its one, two, three, four. It hasn't finished yet, but it's at its time, so D gets one, two, three, four. B got put in the back, so now it gets its the rest of the time it needs, one, two, and then we get the one, two, and then we're done. Um, now notice the difference here. With a quantum of four, A got to do its whole thing, B got to do most of it, C got to do its whole thing, D got to do most of it, so we only had two time slots for B, two time slots um, for D, everybody else got to run their full time. So if you have a zero cost to swap things out, then who cares? But if it takes time to swap things out and put them back in, which was more efficient, the quantum one or the quantum four? Quantum one four. The quantum four, because you didn't have all that swapping back and forth and back and forth. I mean, this thing right here was swapping like mad. Um, and so consequently, even though theoretically everything can get done in time 20, uh, I'll bet you this thing right here would probably end up taking 40 quantums because of all the swapping, right? All right, shortest process first. Um, well, obviously there's only one in the queue here. Um, we get to here, there's only you know one left in the queue. We finally get down to here. Uh, these guys have shown up, but this one is the shortest one because it showed up at time eight. So we're gonna do this one, then this one, then this one, okay? So we had the same number of swaps as we did in the first come first serve, but this guy got moved to the front. So our throughput time, um, uh, I'm sorry, turnaround time, throughput time is the same. Turnaround time is shorter because we moved that shorter job up earlier. All right, shortest job remaining. Um, here we went ahead and split this guy so that since uh, as soon as we did A, then we started to do B, and we didn't let B finish, we went ahead and swapped out as soon as uh, C got here, and then we swapped back up here and went, oh, now the short shot remaining is E, then we pop up here, then we pop down here. So this one's gonna have a much shorter um, turnaround time, but you had a few more swaps, right? And then highest response time was pretty much very similar to this, just swap these two. So questions on how to compare shortest job first or round robin or um, uh, shortest remaining? Yes? That shortest remaining time, just to make sure I'm not picking it up right. So A has a service time of three. Yep. Um, so at two, it's B gets there, but it's still got, A has one left to go and B has six. Right. So it pushes B back. Yep. And then B starts. Yep. And then right after it starts, uh, C gets there and has four. Right. B's only done one, so it still has five left. Yep. So it pushes B out. Yep. And then carry and then does like the rest of them. Right? right. Yeah. Okay. And by the time you get to here, um, E showed up. He only had the two. Mm -hmm. And so he actually gets precedence over um, the rest of B and the rest of D because he only has two left. How does it, I guess it's kind of semantics, how it determines like if they have equivalent service time? Uh, it's going to be whenever they got the queue. Because oh. remember, it's, it's sort of round robin oh, in the queue. Okay. That's right. And so by default, A will always be before B, C, D. Okay. All right. So done. We have completed the first thing on processes. So at this point, where time, the parent process is also running. So let's go ahead and do its 1 to 15, it is counter ID. So what you should end up seeing is some process IDs, 1, 2, 3, 4, 15, the other process ID, 1, 2, 3, 4, 15. If you're on a single CPU and it's not swapping processes, you're gonna see, you know, the child, all 15 of it, and then parent all 15 of it. If it's swapping back and forth, you may see it interspersed. You have a you know, two child, you know, one and two, and then parent one, and then child three and four, and parent uh, two, three, four, five, they'll be interspersed. But any case, so this is the example program, the program that y'all are gonna do, so this one's you know, spawned a few times. In the program y'all are gonna do, you're gonna give it a parameter. 
I want to spawn seven child processes or 12 child processes. And so there'll be multiple ports and each child will then do the same, print the ID and the number, and, uh, and then you should see the output uh, either sequential, you know, serialized, or interspersed. Uh, so this gives you an idea of how to do the uh, spawning. The other example gives you an idea of how to use the command lines and how to uh, bring in those parameters. You merge those two together, make it so that when you read the parameter, it says, oh, I'm going to do seven processes. You do the seven processes, and you're done. So basically, we've given you two C++ things. You merge those together, make two little changes. It shouldn't be a horrible thing, OK? So any, yes? Uh, we don't have access to the uh, arguments example. Really? Well, let me fix that. Let's go here. 